Hello, and welcome to the SCURF Interviews podcast. In this mini-series uh, with DowStar One, we're going to be exploring their DowStart standards project and the intended impact in the industry resulting from it. We're glad to be joined in this first episode with Joshua Tan, who's the executive director of Medigov, and Isaac Patka from Moloch Mystics. And I'll pass it off to you both for some intros. Yeah, sure. Thanks for having me here, Eugene. Right, I'm Josh. I'm the executive director of Medigov and um, mathematician and computer scientist at Oxford and Stanford. Medigov itself is a nonprofit that does research in this space, um, building standards and infrastructure for digital governance. Isaac, would you go ahead? Uh, sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Isaac Patka. I'm, uh, my primary uh, thing that I work on is called Logos DAO. We have a DAO that uh, basically connects people to DAOs and DAOs to other DAOs. Um, and through that, I contribute to a number of DAO ecosystems um, with with my team. So I work with the uh, Moloch DAO, uh, the, the Moloch Mystics ecosystem, um, and the DAO House ecosystem, and a lot of the DAOs in the um, Meta Cartel, Raid Guild, um, a, a lot of stuff throughout that whole ecosystem. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I met um, Josh actually through two through two parallel channels that converged. Um, one was uh, this like artist community that I was helping out, and then also. Um, through a conference that Meta Cartel was hosting called MCon. Um, and yeah, I'm just uh, uh, excited to get started. So I think it would be interesting to start the conversation, and we'll come back to this towards the end as well. But to start the conversation, uh, what exactly is Dow Star One? And then we'll kind of take a step back to where it came from and really why does it exist, and then kind of dig into it a little deeper. But uh, yeah, it would be great to kind of get a sense at a high level of how do you two position what Dow Star One is in general? So DASTAR1 uh, most basically is kind of a, it's a round table of different organizations, uh, uh, key organizations in the DAO ecosystem. So it ranges from, you know, frameworks like, you know, Gnosis, uh, Aragon, Colony, Syndicate, uh, to um, lots of DAO tooling developers uh, like Tally, Abridged, um, Boardroom, and so on, to aggregators like Masari and Deep Dow, right? As well as like major foundations like Ethereum Foundation, Interchain. Uh, so really a large panoply of different organizations uh, and of course like large DAOs, like Compound. The, um, the idea of the round table is to sort of like bring together a whole collection of different people, uh, especially sort of key players who are sort of like building DAOs uh, and sort of thinking about like, how do I implement these things at the technical level? in order to build technical standards. And the reason it exists uh, is because, long story short, we wanted to build these standards uh, and this the round table, this group of people kind of just organically grew up around that standards process. That's great. And Isaac, is that how, how you generally position it as well? Or do you kind of give it a, a different flavor when you do your pitches explaining what Dowstar One is? Uh, yeah, yeah, very aligned with, with uh, Josh there. Um, for me, uh, Dowstar One is just an opportunity to um, improve like legibility and access across DAOs um, and lead to further um, composability and tooling. So while the early problems that we're solving um, are are essential um, to not just make uh, DAOs easier to understand, um, but also unlock uh, many more opportunities for composable organizations, composable governance um, in the future. So it's, uh, it's catching this early um, so that when, as DAOs start, propagating throughout companies and ecosystems and co-ops and neighborhoods and online and offline communities, um, that there is like a shared understanding of what we're actually, uh, what we're actually building. Great. Yeah. Thank you both. And I guess to, to get us to the point of, uh, how did we get here and where did this come from and why is now the right time? It'd be interesting to hear uh, a little bit about how Dow star one came together in the first place. Uh, so Josh, do you mind mentioning kind of what were some of the Genesis, uh, conversations or interactions that actually led to this? Yeah. Uh, so essentially it happened at MCon, uh, last year. So I think when was it MCon? I think October, 2021 September and yeah. uh, September uh, and a group of us were kind of hanging out having a couple of beers um, in the in the venue so it was people from Aragon Gnosis abridged tally um, I think Spencer Graham was there Ivan Fartenov um, I don't I don't think he was there but maybe Oren was there uh, James Young and you know essentially we we're just talking hey doesn't like a DAO standard already exist? Like surely a must. And then we realized, wait, no, actually it doesn't exist. 
actually nobody agrees on what DAOs are. Uh, you know, you bring 10 experts into a single room. It's like I have 10 different definitions of what a DAO is. And there were all these people building different projects, uh, building different frameworks, different tooling with different expectations of what DAOs were. And this, you know, I think like somebody from Syndicate captured it really well, which is, you know, they just said, hey, you know, we're not really confident building on any of these stacks uh, because we're not really sure like what the hell is going on. Uh, I don't think we have like clear expectations. And we're not sure like any of this stuff is going to be around, you know, even like one to two years from now, much as like 10 years. So there was clearly a need for a standard. We just decided like, okay, given that this doesn't already exist, we need to build one. And we just said, let's just start building it. And we started, set up a meeting, brought a bunch of people. We had our first kind of like round table meeting a couple of weeks right after MCON virtually. And we decided, oh, you know, uh, Denver is around four months away. That seems like a pretty good target. And we just started uh, driving toward getting a standard ready by then. I will, I will definitely say that I can't believe it actually only took us four months uh, in some sense. Uh, but that was, I think, bringing in exactly the right people. Um, the people who you know, know exactly what DAOs are have been building with them since day one. And I think it was just a really awesome set of conversations. And I think Isaac uh, can speak more to that as well. Yeah, uh, I actually completely missed all of this happening at MCON. I had no idea that this that this conversation went down and that this all started there. I was there. Um, I was probably like at a picnic table about 100 yards away, but was completely ignorant to this this whole thing. Um, it was not until I think like a few weeks after MCON when I was on a call with like the the Dada art community and Josh popped in because he Medica was helping them I think design design their DAO community standards and stuff and mentioned this uh, MetaGov like inter DAO uh, standards thing and I said wait. How did I miss this? Uh, so I DM'd him, quickly got added to the to the Telegram, joined, and was just uh, um, like kind of thrilled to see the collaboration that was um, already starting to take off. That's great. And just making sure for the initial uh, kind of group of folks contributing to this and thinking about, is this all revolving around the Ethereum ecosystem broadly, or is there a kind of wider collaboration of DAOs across ecosystems at this point? It's actually broader than that. Yeah. It's like um, right now, a lot of DAOs are in uh, in the Ethereum space, um, but I actually do a lot of outreach to DAOs on, on other chains as well. Um, so specifically, like I know some art communities on Tezos that are starting to build um, that are starting to build DAOs and um, the tooling is not quite as mature, but like I'm going into their discords, reaching out, saying, hey, here's a, here's here's this thing that we could be doing together. Uh, I know that like Josh, yeah, I'm working with some folks from other ecosystems as well. So definitely cross chain is just the concentration of devs and and liquidities on Ethereum, but, um, but other uh, definitely not Ethereum exclusive. It was always intended to be uh, multi-chain from the beginning, but we made a commitment sort of like early on to say, you know, it's already a big thing to sort of say, we're going to put together a EIP uh, in time for, you know, within like four months. So we decided just because of that to really focus on the Ethereum ecosystem. But right now we are uh, convened a group of people, including folks from like Cosmos, Tezos, uh, trying to, to bring on somebody. I think we are close to bringing on somebody from Polkadot uh, to basically, and uh, of course, near uh, to figure out uh, what is the multi-chain standard? How can we extend the existing Ethereum standard, EIP, into a kind of like a chain agnostic and improvement proposal? And that's currently something we're uh, working on. Maybe, hopefully, you'll see something in about a month or two. Okay, so hopefully, and I'm assuming there's realistically going to be some delay between this conversation and release. So hopefully in the Mayish timeline, we will see uh, some kind of update on that side. Yeah, possibly sooner. Cool. Exciting. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm interested in kind of digging into a little bit around the question of why is interoperability so important uh, in general when it comes to DAOs and smart contracts? What do you see as being limited without this or what is uh, not possible without these kinds of standards in place? I think that even backing up slightly even further, like when we talk about like what we're trying to accomplish with a, with a DAO standard and interoperability, uh, it, it's... Uh, a lot of the, um, it's it's more about like uh, legibility to start, and like the reason why that that's important is like right now, what's not possible in a DAO ecosystem is to just quickly be able to peer into another DAO and get a quick understanding of what's going on. What's the state like? Who are the members of that DAO? What does that DAO even do? Um, there's a random transaction on EtherScan. Uh, was that a person? Was that a DAO? Like, was that somebody interacting with a DAO? Um, and then um, 
a DAO. Okay, I, I heard about a DAO that decided to do something. Like, how do I how do I find that? Like, so the, this whole concept of um, where DAOs are, who belongs, who's a member of that DAO, what that DAO manages, what that DAO is doing, is very illegible and spread across uh, many many platforms. Often, when you have to do when you're trying to learn about a DAO, it's like doing forensic analysis. You maybe start with a member on Twitter that you know is in that DAO. Okay, did they retweet something that was from, oh, okay, there's the DAO Twitter. Okay, they linked to a Discord. Oh, that Discord invite is, invite is dead. Um, okay, what, what, what assets does this DAO hold? Do they have a website where they feature that? Or is it like impossible to find? I'm, I'm interested in this DAO. Can I join it? Oh, no. It's like I have to DM someone and hope that like all of this is, is kind of the state of DAOs. Um, so there's... Um, it's, it's impossible to aggregate data. Uh, it's impossible to under, uh, just kind of get snapshots on what other DAOs are doing. And what that leads to is so much redundant work um, where uh, you'll be doing something for a few weeks and think like, this is going to be super helpful. And then often the next day you find somebody else that uh, just spent the last two weeks coming to the same conclusion that you did. Um, so yeah, to me, like uh, there's a whole ton of there's tons of inefficiencies in the DAO space due to this uh, lack of legibility um, to start. Maybe we should like define the terms a little bit. Like interoperability, we often think of as like having one tool being able to communicate with another tool, right? Uh, technical interoperability, where I, like I have two services that are getting being able to communicate, like you know having integration between Discord and let's say uh, I don't know, like Snapshot or something. Uh, or like a lot of what Colab that land does, right? Connecting two distinct services and getting them to communicate with another. Uh, when you have like interoperability uh, as a sort of basic, basic assumption, you have this more, let's say, permissionless system where you can like build things and expect them to work. You can sort of plug and play different modules and allows this sort of extensibility, uh, built-in extensibility into the ecosystem. So it's, it's really useful from a technical perspective for if you're like a DAO tooling developer, right? Now, uh, in order to sort of support that, uh, you often need to define, you know, these like common like data schemas. And one thing that we do is we define a set of like very basic uh, data models and schemas for these at least off-chain kinds of data. And like they're already proving useful for various DAO use cases. So they're like effectively being used to support interoperability between different tools because these tools um, or you know the software, these contracts share common assumptions around what data is being produced and the meaning of that data, right? But the focus on legibility is to point out that if we want to extend those use cases, um, ex extend like you know these data models support more interoperability and more use more DAO tooling sort of connections, we need to sort of enhance legibility of these organizations. So Zargon, for example, who is one of the co-authors of the uh, standard, you know, likes to emphasize that you need to do the reporting first. You need to emphasize this legibility first before you can really tackle all those additional use cases uh, and really sort of, you know, grab onto the sort of a, well, what's the right word, uh, benefit from the fruits of, you know, interoperability. The important aspect about like this composability and, and legibility is like that allowing people to do stuff with this that we don't that we can't even anticipate like uh, a lot of people have this vision of this multi dao future where daos are members of other daos and proposals are passed from dao 1 to dao 2 um and like that is a nightmare to manage unless we can at least all agree on how to describe data um and an example that i think might help visualize um in the web3 space if you go to etherscan and you click on a contract etherscan knows that that's an nft contract It'll say ERC seven two one or ERC one one five five. There's even these like rich explorer tabs where you can look at token transfers, and um, you can see like even if it was masked within a com it, within like a complex transaction on OpenSea or Rarible or somewhere, um, you can kind of see the flow of tokens and see like a pie chart of the top holders. All of that rich data is because we've all agreed on how to describe an NFT and like ownership of an NFT. Um, in the non-Web3 space and like the Web2 space, if you're on Google and you look for your local restaurant, um, and if you see on uh, when you look up a restaurant, Google knows that that's a restaurant and it's like, okay, would you like to make a reservation here? Here's their hours. Here's how you get there. Um, what are the What's the general vibe? And like all of that is also possible due to data standards. It's because we've agreed on how to define this is a restaurant, this is a movie, this is a book. 
Um, and that's why we see rich data wherever we go on, on the web. Um, and so that type of rich data is, imagine attaching that to a DAO. And now whenever you see something related to a DAO's transaction, you can see this rich data about um, this is actually an organization uh, that's deciding to add liquidity to a pool on Balancer. Or this is an organization that decided to send money to a coordinate epoch to distribute tokens to their members. Like all of that rich stuff will become possible um, and people will uh, uh, be able to just leverage that for uh, use cases that we haven't even imagined. Yeah, and so on that note, I'd want to kind of double click into the whole idea of what is the kind of rich data that we're talking about here. Uh, I, I know you alluded to sort of where it's coming from, where it's going, who are some of the actors, but what's sort of the, the, set, the, the data set that you would hope would be captured with something like this? So the actual data that's being captured is actually extremely simple. Um, so if you read the EIP, uh, EIP 4824, read the actual standard, uh, or just go to downstar.org and you can click to the standard, it's all, all online. Uh, you'll see like the schema itself is extremely basic um, because in some sense, we didn't want to overdefine things and sort of introduce overly rigid standards that don't match the actual use cases in DAOs. Uh, and we also wanted to design something that's like fundamentally extensible. Um, so we just like build the basic things that we think like this is like DAO primitives. And then, uh, well, okay, let, 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 me, let me back up. Maybe <laughs> jump into uh, what the actual thing is. So basically the standard uh, imagines DAOs as really being defined by two extremely basic things. A DAO uh, has behavior, which is just the smart contract behavior, let's say. So that's inherited from the fact that it's a smart contract. And a DAO has members. So it has behavior and members. Uh, and that is fundamentally like these are two primitive things about a DAO. And then sort of built on top of that, uh, we assume that there is some way for the members of a DAO to meaningfully affect the behavior uh, of the contract, right? And that's how we define proposals as one mechanism, uh, one very common mechanism for essentially membership to affect or influence the behavior of the contract. And this fundamentally is how like philosophically the DAO is uh, the, the sort of the standard defines a DAO uh, or looks at it. Uh, if you follow that, then it's actually, it's very basic. So the EIP defines a uh, set of members. So you can define a set of members of a DAO and you can define the proposals that the DAO emits. And then there's something called an activity log uh, in which you can define certain relationships uh, between members and proposals. So for example, you know, like voting on proposal, submitting a proposal, executing something like that. But I'd also just like to take a, a quick detour into what is sort of the state of DAO tooling right now as it pertains to this and what is kind of the landscape and are there any things that do interact together or is it only within kind of stacks that are developed? So I, I'm sure all Aragon tools can uh, talk to each other on the data level, but is that sort of the extent of, the, of DAO tooling at the moment? One of my, one of my favorite bits of uh the DAO ecosystem that's being worked on is like the zodiac guild um so this is a group that started through uh through gnosis i think through like that kind of some attached to the gnosis safe ecosystem and um the purpose of zodiac is to allow any governance framework or any rules to plug into a safe which traditionally people think of as just a multi-sig um not just but like if, as a multi-sig with owners and, and abilities to execute um, the Zodiac interface allows you to plug any governance framework that you want into that uh, into that uh, into that wallet uh, without having to move any assets, without having to change anything. And so it's very useful if you're starting out a DAO and you want to deposit some funds and you don't want to have to like get locked into a framework. If you just put it into a safe, um, you can upgrade governance over time. And a great example of this um, uh, we is the integration between uh, DAO House and Gnosis through this interface. So we had uh, at Dow House, we had heard about um, this Zodiac uh, interface being under development. We were working on a new version of a contract called a minion, which listens to a DAO and executes certain smart contract calls based on the actions of the DAO. Um, and we were actually pretty close to releasing it when Deacon from Dow House um, added me to a group chat with Aaron from Gnosis and said, hey, Gnosis is going to come out, is going to announce this thing called Zodiac soon. I wonder if this would be useful for our minions. Um, and we looked at it and we thought, wow, this 
immediately allows us to rip out a bunch of code that we thought we had to write. Um, and uh, within about, I think we had like a proof of concept in a day and like a production version in a couple of weeks, um, we were able to prove that a DAO built on one framework could control a tool built by a completely separate group with completely separate tools without really any overlap between them. And so like there, uh, and tons of people are now building like modules um, through this like Zodiac interface. I think it's a really good example of, of composability that's happening um, already. That's great. And I guess are, from both of your perspectives, what are the things that you hope this kind of standard would be able to unlock, assuming, of course, people readily use it? Because just a standard that is not adhered to is its own thing. But assuming there's buy-in and, and folks start doing this, like what would you want to see in the first kind of months after wide adoption in the industry? One of the first things we want to do, uh, and we're already sort of like building support and I've gotten tentative uh, agreement from folks like DeepDAO, uh, reaching out to Masari and Etherscan, is to enable this kind of like DAO discovery and DAO legibility, right? Uh, to have these DAOs, uh, uh, to allow DAOs to publish the data and make it easily discoverable via these kinds of like aggregators and platforms. So that's one of the very first things that we're doing. Um, one of the use cases that uh, we're currently actually uh, right now working on uh, that's quite exciting, I would say, is uh, some use cases around DAO uh, reputation uh, or sorry, identity systems within DAOs. So this is a work with um, part of a developing working group um, coming in, that's happening in DAO Star 1 and extending the current EIP. Uh, folks like um, you know, Sysmo, Spruce, uh, Disco, the protocol and other folks, uh, deep skills, uh, working together to kind of find like how do we extend the basic database, uh, the basic data model uh, of members and activities uh, to support these like verifiable credentials or like Web three CVs, the ability to sort of submit, you know, prove that you are a member of a DAO of in good standing or you were a member of the DAO in good standing. And then sort of offer this to other DAOs so you can say, oh, now I can like feel more comfortable hiring this person, right? Various sort of like basic use cases that like directly extend the data model we put out. Uh, we just need a little bit further agreement on uh, like how exactly to expose these kinds of credentials uh, when DAOs publish that data and where things get stored and like issues around privacy. Uh, essentially like questions that we actually discussed a lot in the original um, uh, working group that built the first standard, uh, but realized was like, too big a chunk to bite off uh, in the first initial four months. Yeah, I think that that would, uh, when we talk about things that people would actually use as far as a standard, um, like that to me has like instant uh, instant utility. Um, because when I am on Discord and my you know max 100 servers and I get a random DM from one of them, um, one of the first things I filter to see am I even going, if, I, if like the first thing I look at is like mutual servers. If it's one, I think spam. If it's nine, I think, oh, real person. And then I click and see like, okay, which, which DAOs do I share? Like having that just gut check uh, reputation reaction is something that is really important for uh, when you're assessing whether you're going to interact with a certain address um, or, or anything like that. So I think that'd be super useful. Also, a use case that I would hope to see, something that would show that we were successful is if I, uh, whether it's uh, the DAO or, or Etherscan or something, if I can go to a DAO address um, and the DAO gets automatically tagged as, oh, this is an X type of DAO's treasury, I would think that's that's already like such a, a 10X thing that helps me when I'm trying to just decipher what's going on. Um, and one of the things that uh, that I'm building with, I mentioned like this Logos DAO is, uh, you can kind of think of it almost like a an exchange for, for DAOs, uh, um, but with, like within a curated ecosystem and just making it so that at least within a small curated corner of the space, um, it's easy to know uh, how I get into this DAO, what's going on with activity, like what's like what's what's uh, what do I need to keep an eye on? Because um, I fall behind all the time on like have to sign this multi sig transaction, I have to vote on this thing, and I need some context for this thing before I feel comfortable voting on it. So at least starting with like a small curated section of DAOs, um, I'm planning on at least using all of this rich data to help build that. Um, that uh, that exchange functionality. Yeah, it's really interesting. And that also just makes me think of, I mean, some of these elements I think are, are clearer to understand of how they live in the data. But when it comes to elements of, you know, I 
my presence in 10 DAOs versus the quality of my contribution in 10 DAOs are also very different. And, you know, things like onboarding uh, and making it easier to actually delve into a system and know what's actually going on there, or even the quality of a DAO of, oh, they have 10,000 members, but is it just 10,000 people aping into something with no actual intention of building a community? And I guess, how do both of you think of some of the things that start, some of the elements that start being much more qualitative in nature and how you bring it back down to kind of data and metrics? when it comes to standards like this? At least from my perspective, like it's a really hard question. Uh, and, and it's really visible in the conversations that I have as part of Dow Star One, actually. Uh, so as you can imagine, like, you know, the, the standards body has a lot of, uh, let's say, Dow tooling companies or also Dow tooling DAOs, right? Uh, to, but piece, pe people who are interested in building tooling and technical infrastructure to support like better DAO governance, better DAO operations, and a variety of different things, right? Uh, or like DAO frameworks for creating like the literal DAOs themselves. And these folks care a lot about, you know, these uh, standards because they're like the things like these data models they have to work with every single day, right? And it's really important that they get them right uh, and ideally like minimize the amount of change they have to do and facilitate like, you know, lots of things like interoperability and extensibility. Uh, but like when I talk to the DAOs themselves, they care about these particular use cases, right? Around, oh, how can I like manage these contributors? How do I sort of foster engagement? And it's not like a question that like a standard on its own can directly address. Uh, the standard, at least the way I think about it, you know, is built to support all this additional tooling that can then more easily tackle all these sort of like end use cases that we care about, like, you know, things like legibility or, you know, contributions or management engagement. Yeah, and that also makes me wonder if at all in terms of various DAO tooling companies, have any actually given any kind of pushback? Because I'm just, you know, putting my uh, my Web2 lens on things back, uh, back on, uh, right? I can see how someone says, oh, well, actually complying with this kind of standard, while it gives us more interoperability with the ecosystem, can make us somehow lose our proprietary advantage. And I, I realize this is very much against the ethos of like open source development and everything. But still, I'm just wondering, I don't know, has that been a thing? And I'm sure you all have talked to hundreds of DAOs, uh, hundreds of DAO contributors across hundreds of DAOs. Has that actually been a point of pushback or is everyone kind of on the open source bandwagon and into it? Amazingly, no, there's been exactly zero pushback and everybody in this ecosystem is super, in, like they say, oh, what? A DAO standard, like exactly what we need. Yes, let's do this. We are 100% in. And it's like, it's actually kind of amazing the amount of immediate um, I guess traction and enthusiasm that we receive because I think people here are very much like you know if you're building in crypto like there's an expectation that you are going to be like relatively open source and sort of open with your data because uh, I think that's just really the ethos of this community and I think it's wonderful um, and that we're focused on building interoperable protocols and supporting this kind of like let's say ecosystem public goods also uh, something that Spencer said on our first call, Spencer Graham from Dow House was, um, correct me if I get the quote wrong, Josh, but let's challenge each other not to build empires. Uh, to me, my interpretation is like, um, this is a this is an ecosystem where people believe in positive sum uh, collaborations. Um, and when what we're working on together is going to be so much greater than what we can do indiv individually. As the Dow standard matures and there are other like very focused platforms that spin up to kind of web three of um, web three of different community chats or groups and stuff. I bet we will see um, who self selects into this type of uh, standards community versus who is like, okay, well we can just add crypto to a message group, charge a subscription fee for it and, and see if that becomes a company. I'm sure those exist, um, but they're probably just not self selecting into the kinds of conversations that we're having, that we're having. Um, and hopefully um, we can build better products together uh, in this op in this more open ecosystem. It's great hearing that that's the case so far in uh, in driving the standard forward. And I, I still 
am always fascinated by looking at DAOs and kind of exploring what's happening in communities from the perspective of uh, how does ego management work in these environments? And, you know, like some of these things are a little counter to at least growing up in, in the States and, uh, you know, being taught to think certain ways. And so I wonder, uh, as you're going through and planning the actual technical infrastructure, you're building the community, getting all the relevant stakeholders in there, is there an element of just culture change that either you know, we either need to reinforce already some of what's happening or just an actual pivot around culture and thinking to make everyone be excited about these kinds of changes. There is some unlearning that has to happen uh, when people move from like the web two space into the web web three space. Um, and for me, it was uh, it was actually nice. Like the when I when I broke into like certain more collaborative aspects of the web three space, I got to think like, OK, my natural tendency towards collaboration and openness is not um, is not a business weakness. Um, as it might feel like it is when you're trying to build just like a normal startup. Um, I think that uh, for people that have had to operate in that ecosystem, they do have to like think, okay, not building moats, stickiness, pretend, like I'm not like, you, you think in different types of terms, you think about extensibility and composability and, and value creation. Um, uh, so for me, it was nice because uh, I was like thinking that I would have to go down the unlearning path of unlearning collaboration and go towards being more competitive. But uh, I've enjoyed the fact that I've been able to just uh, strengthen my collaborative side. And I would just add, I absolutely agree. And maybe what I've noticed uh, is that in some ways, if you compare this like to like, let's say previous eras in internet history, um, there's much more uh, because like, you know, the open source sort of ethos is so much more developed. And I think because crypto, um, what is it? Uh, somebody said like crypto is like terribly explained uh, because it's, you know, very technical in lots of ways. And the people who try and explain it, like choose technical explanations. But I think that sort of more engineering ethos um, has really benefited and carried over into the decisions that these organizations actually make in terms of like collaboration, instead of like building legal moats uh, or like business moats around certain products, right? I really focus on achieving technical, um, you know, technical goals and producing really cool technology. And I think it's still very much, we're still in that phase where I think all this cool tech is being built and we're just exploring this ecosystem and everybody is, feels more, much more free. And it's so interesting to think about that kind of unlearning side, because you know, to because part of what I was, I was hearing and what you were just saying, Josh, is the fact that I feel like a lot of the people who self-selected into building this industry were the kind of people who are already deeply bought into open source and had a certain personal ethos. And I, I mean, it's not fair to to brush uh, to paint everyone with the same color brush, but I, I feel like it had a higher proportion than other you know new tech startup areas. And the question of unlearning is a really interesting one because I know I, I when I first got into it, there was very much like the mindset shift that I had to continuously remind myself of and, and that it's like, no, it's this thing that I'm naturally into, but was disencouraged in the corporate environment. But I wonder, is there either have you seen or, or is there something that you would like to see in terms of more structured unlearning when coming into this space? Because I see a lot of, you know, like onboarding Web2 people into Web3. It's like, oh, well, let, let's get them explainers on blockchain and let's get them a DAO wiki and let's get them all these things to explain how amazing the things that we're doing are. And I haven't heard as much of, yeah, but let's focus on how much you like working with other people. And like, let's start from that, like purely human collaborative perspective. That would be really interesting. Yeah, there's not nearly enough resources on that side of blockchain, which is like how to how to um, re-educate yourself for the Web three uh, for the Web three space. And like, I think that something like that targeted towards um, targeted towards uh, people that have gone through Web Web two startup accelerators, and like maybe somebody that went through those. I didn't really go through those, but like, here's what you learned. Here's how it's different. Like. That would be a very, very interesting content series because I, I deal with a lot of folks that are that have had long careers in, in the Web2 space. Um, and just uh, I, I do that one by one every time I have a phone call with them. But um, perhaps that would be a nice content series. I would just also um, point out that these kinds of collaborations, and maybe this is something to put my you know, researcher academic hat on, uh, you know, arrive or are possible because of certain institutions, right? There are techno products that allow, you know, let's say relatively decentralized collaboration that facilitate this kind of like one-to-one -one or, you know, many to many sort of peer production. Uh, and there are institutions, Dowster one among them, uh, that facilitate 
partnerships between different organizations, right? Sort of agglomerations of group of people uh, that facilitate uh, connections, um, communication, and ultimately collaboration instead of competition. So I think many, uh, maybe another way of saying of this, uh, we should pay respect to previous generations of people um, of the internet, of even web two, that have produced infrastructure that we're using, things like, you know, like Git and GitHub, right? Uh, that we use to collaborate and that, you know, have set certain defaults for us in terms of how we collaborate and how we work together. Uh, and those things are amazing. And we're just now building more institutions and really, I think, diving into that and committing to that ethos and taking it, I think, to its you know, next progression, right? I think that's one of the truly exciting things about this space where we're sort of all trying to work together. It's a great analog. Like I, I think about um, when I have the moment where I first decide I'm going to try, I'm going to test out this DAO, see if I can collaborate, see if they're a welcoming bunch. Um, it's kind of the same feeling I get when I find an open source tool on GitHub that I'm using and maybe found a bug in and I file an issue and then I think, well, maybe I'll just file a pull request and fix it myself. And then you file it and the dev responds, thank you so much for contributing to this and, and you fix it and then your thing gets merged and now you are a you're forever in the Git history of this tool that you like. Um, it, it's, it's a very similar feeling. Um, and you're right, that was built, that infrastructure has enabled everything else that we're doing, like uh, open source collaborative repositories are, have, uh, have, have made it so like, um, so that we can get to this point. Yeah, it's interesting to think of what are what are the right ways to both pay respect to the tools and people who got us here while simultaneously unlearning the societal and kind of corporate mentality that might have unintentionally creeped into some of those, because also just thinking of previous iterations of startups and everything. And, you know, the, the complaint of like the startup or founder journey of going from ideological purity to then investing and growth phase, and then it becomes a very different kind of game. But uh, recognizing that we're uh, unfortunately getting toward the tail end of the conversation. I wanted to make sure to give a chance to just talk about, uh, you know, for folks who actually want to be part of helping move these kinds of things forward and contribute to this, uh, what are the ways that people can actually get involved and collaborate with the Dow Star One community? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we host an open community call uh, every two weeks. Uh, you can go to DowStar.org. I think they are currently Thursdays um, at around noon Eastern time on the, in the U.S. Uh, and they're open to anybody. Hop on in. Uh, tell us what you think about the standards that we're working on. Um, tell us what you think you know could be improved. Tell us about your use case and how our standard kind of sucks and doesn't address it. We would love to sort of get you to participate. Um, and if you're an organization that's building tooling or just a DAO that's you know thinking about upgrading to the standard, uh, please reach out to Isaac myself uh, or just hop on like um, the website again and just like contact us. We really love to work with you to figure out how to, you know, make the standard work worthwhile and workable for you. And if I'm not mistaken, Dowstar is also in a phase right now where it's actually trying to fundraise to be able to uh, build all these activities and do all the all the various uh, time intensive efforts necessary to make this happen. Am I correct on that side? Uh, yes, a lot of the member organizations are also contributing to funding for things like reference implementations and. Um, and reviews and uh, everything that helps the standard operate and, and, and propagate throughout the ecosystem. So uh, a lot, so it's, it's actually quite important to us that anybody that contributes to this is bought in, uh, bought in ideologically and is uh, contributing to the groups and um, has some commitment to adopting this standard um, as it comes out. Um, we're thinking about different ways to play with um, incentives for organizations to adopt this um, beyond like intrinsic. So um, if you want, also want to play around with uh, incentive models and how standards get adopted, um, lots of room for experimentation there. And if you're a developer that wants to dive in and build reference implementations, there's funding for you to come in and help. Awesome. And is there anything else that you both want to mention about the initiative or, uh, or just getting this kind of activity started that we didn't touch on in the conversation? Maybe I'll mention one thing. We are uh, going to be announcing something at um, DevConnect in Amsterdam. Uh, so that'll be uh, late April. So if you're around, come by. We'll be having some events related to Dowstar 1 and the standard. We, we pop up in various different governance conversations and conferences all over all over the place. So um, yeah, if, if you see us, then uh, yeah, hope to see you in person at some point soon. 
Absolutely, and slight shameless plug in a different direction on the Dev Connect week. There's also going to be a DSI day in Amsterdam that week, which should be fun and provide a bunch of different opportunities for folks to talk about uh, uh, activities at the intersection of decentralization and science. But anyway, yeah, thank you both for uh, joining us today. This was a great conversation. And thank you to the listeners for joining in and listening to Scurf interviews. If you want to learn more about Dowstar, please check out their site, dowstar.org. Uh, this podcast was brought to you by the Smart Contract Research Forum, or SCURF. Uh, the SCURF interview team consists of myself, Eugene, uh, Yvonne, Rich, Anukriti, James, Loretta, and Tobogo. Uh, to learn more about SCURF, check out smartcontractresearch.org. And we'll have a specific forum post up for this episode where you can interact and uh, ask some questions there if, for whatever reason, you're too shy to just get right involved in the Dowstar stuff. So, yeah, thank you both again and have a great day.